How do you get from this type of random ink blot to a finished monster? That's what we're going to be looking at today. And I'm going to, in real time, show you two different approaches to drawing ink monsters. Because one of the most common questions I get is, do I know what I'm going to draw when I make the random ink blot? Or is it truly random? And the answer is, it is random, but you can also choose for it to not be as random. And I'm going to show both of these approaches. My name is Kim Diasholm. I'm also called an Ungeherholm. I've been doing these daily ink monsters for three years or so now, more than three years. And I'm doing it as a way of... Um, of spicing up my life with a little bit of daily creativity. No matter if I have good days or bad days, I always have time to do one ink monster. And I'm diagnosed bipolar, so some days are good and some days are truly bad. And that little dose of creativity is very essential for me for getting a more balanced life. Now, the reason why I have this ink blot laying around is because I made it someday and I didn't like it, so I didn't even start drawing anything on it. And that's one of the most important things to remember is that these ink blots are not precious. And a lot of artists, you know, struggle with thinking their art is precious in a part of the process where it's really not. Especially at the beginning of an art project, you can draw a couple of lines and just, if you don't like it, you can toss it away. And that might be better. It's, art isn't precious. And you know, when you start closing in on having done a finished piece, then it starts becoming more precious. And then you get into that, you know, don't mess up mode and that extra adrenaline might help you you know finish a painting or a drawing better than it would if you hadn't had that spike of adrenaline but you shouldn't have that at the beginning of the process because you can't sustain it quite long enough well here are a couple of more of the different ink monsters that i've started and just abandoned because I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I don't know what I've done here. I've drawn something. I don't remember this. I started something. I don't like it. And here are a couple of examples of uh, ink monsters I've done that I've liked. This one I did on a live and um, it was a lot of pressure, so a lot of adrenaline. It was sort of precious from the beginning because of doing it at, on a live. While this one, here I was having a bad day. So I chose to do a very simple Puglifant. I love this Puglifant. Another one, one I Ian, like him as well. He's a bit wonky. And that's probably how I felt that day, that day, either because of the lack of time or because of lack of creative energy. So doing something very easy, very simple with the ink monsters is you know, perfect for those days. Let's start. So we're going to do two ink monsters. One where I show you what happens when my reins are free and I can do whatever I want. Now, let's see if we can get some ink here. Oh, I'm almost, almost run out of ink. I have run out of ink. Let's do it like this instead. See, oh, there is the ink. Now, for this first ink monster, I'm going to just dab it like this and not decide 
uh, not have any idea of what I'm going to draw. And for the second one, I'm going to do the same, but I'm going to decide beforehand that it's going to be a troll. And I'll get into the reason why later. So when I stare at the ink blots to try to decide what it is, I can do a lot of different things. So for instance, I see two teeth here and a little eye. So I could make a monster face there. And that could be here, up here. Here are some interesting shapes. So if I was going to do a troll, this would be like the troll nose. Um, here is an eye, but it looks, it looks a little bit wrong. So I don't like it quite. And there's probably countless other things I could see here. Like here is the nose of a bear and the eye. Um, I, I could probably, the longer I stare at it, the more options I could see. But I usually don't stare at it more than a couple of uh, seconds, uh, 10 seconds, 20, 30 seconds, because I want to do it quick. I want to do it impulsively. And as I said, it's not precious at this point. So if I felt like doing something complicated, I could you know, start drawing the bear face here and make a were bear or make a some sort of bear like uh, hog like some sort of creature. Or I could, you know, use this to make the beginning of a face. We could have a nose down here or any diff any number of different complicated options. But days where I'm feeling exhausted or don't have a lot of time, I often just start by placing a couple of eyes somewhere here. Let's do an eye. That's an eye. Oh, and then we actually have an eye there. And it's uh, a bit of a wonky eye. So he'll get a wonky eye here as well. <laughs> and then you already have something. Now this one will be very cartoony. So we're using the pattern here as a shadow to shape the top of the head. This one is going to look a little bit like Soidberg, I'm noticing, from Futurama. So maybe just go with that. Go with some tentacles. And since he is backlit, apparently, the tentacles should be backlit as well. So we're drawing the tentacles first. And then... After we've drawn a couple of tentacles like those, always make sure that some of the tentacles go behind the others. So after these tentacles, we outline them. And then you don't outline both sides on all the tentacles. But on one side you outline, you, so there's a little bit of light from this direction and a little bit of light from that direction. So you try to outline it like that. And it's kind of fun to guess where, you know, when the random inkblot is deciding where the light is, then it's kind of fun to you know, guess how the shadows, what the shadows are describing. It's which shapes the shadows are describing and how they dictate the shadows for the rest of the thingamabob. Oh, like this. He's not very handsome. So, yeah, looks a little bit like Soidberg, a little bit like Cthulhu. And uh, we're going to, we're going to do him like Cthulhu. So we're going to give him some little wings membranous wings to to fly through the cosmos 
and then a little arm and I want to keep this very cartoony so I'm not going to do a huge amount of detail here but we're going to keep the shadows and we're going to yeah we're giving him a little weird body I thought first that I should do him sick, uh, sitting like the bas relief drawn in uh, or described in uh, Lovecraft's story Call of Cthulhu but then I saw this little butt here and I thought ooh maybe we can give him this sort of pear shaped body and that would be fun and two very tiny legs this is looking silly and when I talked about not being precious I'm noticing that right now I'm starting to get a little bit precious because I like some aspects of him I like the eyes but I also dislike some parts so then I have to make a choice will I get precious and finish the drawing or should I just toss it away I'm very close to tossing it away but I think I will see this one through even though it could be better it could it could always be better okay now this isn't the because of uh, because of the body this isn't the easiest ink monster I could draw I'm doing things a little bit complicated for myself but it's still reasonably easy and cartoony and silly and we need the other arm and that arm needs a hand we're going to do the hand up like this and he's going to hold the finger up again the lighting on both sides a little bit of lighting here doesn't have to be very realistic but yeah yeah starting to come together a little bit messy in here could probably could probably go over with some white ink as well but I think I'm going to leave it as this just try to create some softer shadows with a dry brush yeah and then some stupid legs stupid legs is always the best and I will call him Cutulu because he's cute have I called a monster Cutulu before I probably I can't remember it sounds very obvious so this is number 12 13 and it's cute Tulu it reminds me of uh, the call of the cute cutie mark episode of my little pony cute Tulu uh, like this and for good measure I always do some a little bit of shadow underneath and also if you ink blots ink spatters because that looks good now you have him cute Thulu Cutulu I, I don't know how you pronounce it now oh every time after I sign it I always notice some 
like tiny detail I have to fix here and there. Always some tiny detail. Okay, better, better. Almost good. Yeah, I like him, I like him. Let's do number 1214 and let's do a little notice here. And we're going to write, I'm a gonna draw, I'm a gonna, I'm a gonna draw a troll. A troll. Very professional, okay? So again, we're going to do the ink spatter. Ooh, almost running out of ink. And I'm going to close my eyes while I do this, just to not influence it too much. Because you can subtly influence the shape of the ink blot when you've done it a lot of times. But the thing that happens now that we know that this is a troll is that our options are, we still have a lot of options, but the options are more limited. So I could say that this is a part of a nose and have the troll like that, or I could like that is the nose. And I'm going to draw a troll that is kind of um, a Norwegian style troll. So it's going to be, based on Kittelsen's and Erik Wadenskjold's trolls. It's going to be those big-nosed, uh, ugly, fantastic Norwegian trolls. But I could also go on this side and say that, okay, this is an eye and here is a long nose that way, or like here starts the nose, or it could be looking at us and here is the nose, but I think sort of the best troll shape I'm seeing now is the one with the nose down here. So we're going to try for that one. And when I try this, I am i don't know how the complete troll will look just yet, but I'm starting to see an outline. I'm starting to see how the troll might be hunched over and how how it, 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 the head is shaped, how the hair will shape itself. And um, right now, you know, I, I said that it will be a Norwegian troll that's very closely based on the troll style of Theodor Kittelsen. Uh, but right now I'm seeing a lot of John Bauer in it. And John Bauer is, for those who don't know, Theodor Kittelsen is the artist who defined how Norwegian trolls look. And then Theodor Kittel, no, John Bauer is the artist who defined how Swedish trolls look. And I don't know quite where you can see Kittelsen's influence today outside of Norway. You can see, you know, He's been used for album covers, for black metal albums, and he, he's still influential. But I, I can't really think of a mainstream fantasy property where you see a lot of his work. But John Bauer's work you see a lot of in, um, in uh, Brian Froud's art. You see a lot of it in things like The Dark Crystal. And uh, yeah. And so this is looking a little bit more Bauer-like, but it will probably end up Kittelsen-like. An interesting thing about, about uh, Norwegian trolls is that they had some characteristics in the fairy tales and the folk tales and the sagas and the mythology 
uh, you know, you have Norse mythology where it describes a Jotun, the, the mother or the grandmother of the god Tyr, describes her as having a hundred heads or a thousand heads. I, I don't remember. And you have uh, the word troll is sort of used for any supernatural ominous presence. So uh, anything from a uh, from a, a, a what we consider a troll today to a basilisk to a mermaid to ghostly figures, everything can be a troll. And then it slowly starts morphing into becoming more and more of of a specific thing, a specific sort of malicious but stupid, often, nature force. And then in the fairy tales, they have sort of almost concretized into these big, giant, malicious, stupid things with some characteristics like a big nose and big eyes and yeah many heads often uh, but if you look at art Norwegian art from of trolls they don't really feature any of those characteristics until the national romantic era and until Theodor Kittelsen gets his hands on the assignment of drawing the a, a Norwegian fairy tale collection in the 1880s, 1890s, something like that. Uh, before that, all trolls in art are just they're like round, pudgy, weird-looking humans. At least from what I've found, and I haven't found any sort of source that exhibits the troll-like features before Kittelsen. If I'm not mistaken, he got the assignment uh, from his older friend, Erik Wadenschol, uh, uh, and then both uh, him and Wadenschol sort of defined how the look for the books were, and even other artists such as Otto Sindig um, took from Kittelsen's interpretations of trolls. And now if you visit cities like Bergen, you will uh, see a lot of these long-nosed trolls around as sculptures and drawings, and they're kind of everywhere. So I want this troll to be peeping his head out from the woods, so we're going to be drawing some trees here, just the silhouettes of trees, because tree silhouettes are easy to draw, and then some tree silhouettes behind here as well. So it's a troll peeping out behind the trees. And as you probably notice, this drawing is taking a little bit longer time than the first drawing. And one of the reasons is, you know, that I chose a more complex thing to draw. And the other is, you know, n not everything about the original inkblot will fit 100% to the troll I'm drawing, so I had to manipulate it a little bit more than I would with the first piece. I didn't really have to manipulate it uh, a lot, and that it, it was a re there was a reason why I chose to draw a troll, and I, that's because if I make an ink blot monster and I want to do something more in this not so cartoony style, and I want to have it easy for myself, I draw a troll or a zombie. You can always find a troll or a zombie in 
these ink blots because that's what we the this is a sort of a question of uh, of uh, what's it called uh, your ability to spot faces in random shapes or s spot um, spot patterns in randomness and um, now I'm blanking on uh, what the name for that ability is, but my point is that the easiest thing to see is always faces. Now it can be like the face of a big cat or of a wolf or of a snake or something like that, but 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 we're most trained to see human faces in random patterns and since these patterns are random it's most easy to make something that's kind of ugly and twisted but human-like so a zombie or a troll is always the easiest i could have said that i'm going to draw a dragon and i would have managed to do that. In fact, I think that's what I did on the live where I did the dragon uh, that I showed earlier. I think I decided first, based on a request, that hey, I'm going to do a dragon and then I made the ink blot. So that's perfectly possible, but it's more complicated. Now I'm going to, this here sort of reminds you of atmospheric haze or some mist or something like that. It's also a very easy way of not having to draw details and not having to blend these two into each other. So we're making it easy for ourselves. And a lot of the tricks I do with these uh, ink monsters is how to make it easy for myself. but. If you look at this composition right now, I, with a Cthulhu, it was okay because it was just a Cthulhu standing there and no problem, it looked nice enough. But here we have a very, this looks more like a finished picture, a finished drawing, and we have a very unbalanced composition. And I'll take the... I'll extend the white or the black out to the edges here because if it's if I extend the, the ink to the edges on one side of the drawing I want to do it on the others as well. And the reason why I do it on here is because in order to balance the, the composition I'm going to draw a night sky here behind the, the clouds and we're going to do a moon like this and we could probably do a couple of stars as well Sometimes I, I leave a little uh, white frame around the ink, around the drawing. Other times I draw it all the way to the edges and that sort of depends on how the composition feels. And in this case I thought it felt correct to do it like this. And then a little bit of some ink spatter. We're almost out of ink now, so it's lucky that we're almost finished. These small spatters will just help tie the image together because of the messy style that I'm already doing. 
And then we're going to sign and number it. It's going to be number 1214. Yep, yeah, 1214. And we'll just call him Old Forest Troll. That's all we need. I Sometimes I refer to mythology or fairy tales. Sometimes I make up silly names. Other times I just call it for what it is. And it is an old forest troll. And now that we've signed it, let's see if there's some small things we need to fix. And there's always some things you need to fix. Just extend the, the shadow here a little bit more so it looks more correct, like this, and also fix a little bit here. And then I think we've got it. By George, we've got it. So let's look at both of them and um, Hopefully this was a useful way to understand some of the differences between doing an inkblot monster where you have pre-decided what to draw and one where you just go with the flow. And if you're new at drawing ink monsters or doing a similar type of exercise, I would recommend to just go with the flow. Make an inkblot, create some eyes on it and make something silly. And then as you advance in skills, especially if you have studied constructive drawing and comic book drawing and concept design drawing, then you can start playing around and, uh, and just doing the ink blots as a way to, to put a little bit of randomness into the predetermined drawing. Anyhow, if you like what I do and if you like videos like this, then please do push, push, blur, blur, blur. I'm very professional. Please do push the subscribe button. And if you want these pieces, then they will eventually be scanned and uploaded to my gallery for free use. All my art is released for free use. That means you can download it. You can print it, you can make t-shirts, you can use it as an album cover, you can use it to illustrate your book, you can use it in your RPG. And you don't owe me anything except putting my name on whatever you do. Attribution. Uh, I release it all under a Creative Commons attribution license. And if you think that's cool, or if you think my art is cool, then please do check out my Patreon, where you can support me with $1 a month or more. If only 1% of you supported with $1 a month, that would change my life. I have a lot of people around on social media that are already uh, supporting, but if we could come up to 1%, that would radically change my life and I could make even more art. So thank you for watching this video and... Uh, Please, uh, please, yeah, share, have fun and draw something cool. See you around.